All right, everyone, let's get started. Welcome to Lunchalytics year five or six. So we've survived this long. Uh, we have changes, though, to announce. This year, we actually are growing up, and we have an advisory board of people who are helping do this. So this isn't just me and a couple other Dark Horse people that we wrangle into doing it. But we have our good friend, Reese Schwinard, who is actually speaking tonight, he, or this at lunch today. He is one of our board advisors. So the advisory board sounds really official, but really it means they just make a lot of phone calls and emails and try and organize the event. Uh, Dana is also on the advisory board, Dana Marsh, and uh, that's fantastic. And Russ Fenske, Russ Fenske is also on the advisory board. And lastly, Craig Hiltz. That's Craig. So four people are, are actually have stepped up. There are still opportunities, though, for you to help out. And this is not like a job for life for those who have volunteered to be advisory board members. Um, so if you would like to help out coordinating things, ordering food, choosing what we're going to eat, uh, finding speakers, finding sponsors, that would be great. Uh, and come talk to me or one of the other people I mentioned uh, after the event. Secondly, we have sponsors. We actually have two sponsors who stepped up and paid for almost half the season already. So that's great news. And I would like to thank those sponsors. Now I better make sure I remember who they are. Oh, yes. Nate is sponsoring us, and it's within the computer training center at Nate. So they do training. Uh, is, is anyone, is Surrender here? Anyone from Nate here? So they do training in data science. You can take a data science course at Nate on like Friday, Saturday for four weeks. Uh, and it's actually several different courses that they package together into a data science diploma program. Has anyone here taken that? Anyone taken the Nate data science? No? Okay. Uh, Surrender will be here probably next month or the month after to talk about it. And uh, I know a few people are in the program right now. Um, and I think it's pretty good. So that's great. And we're thankful for Nate for their support. There's also another group called Alberta Data Products. Uh, unfortunately, they can't be here today, but they are also sponsoring the whole season. And Alberta Data Products takes a lot of the spatial and government data together, packages it up, and then they provide products to different industry groups, like show me all the roads plus the gravel pits plus uh, the graders in the province or things like that. So they also work with entrepreneurs, I think, that you can actually come to them and say, hey, you know, I want to develop a data product. Uh, but they, they're almost like a clearinghouse of a lot of the data. We will have a representative from them to tell us what they really do uh, probably next month or so. So today, uh, Lunchalytics number 41. Uh, machine learning. We have two speakers, Shazan Jabbar. He's gonna. He's from the Amy Group. He's gonna talk about text analytics, and uh, we're very excited about that. Followed by Reese, uh, a perennial favorite. So, without further ado, Reese is going to start. <laughs> Sorry about that. And while Reese is setting up, let's do a quick show of hands. How many of you? Our students. Oh yeah, class are starting. It's kind of hard. There's only three of you. Okay, how many of you are academics or researchers of some kind? No. Okay, so that's good. So it's mostly producers of analytics. You are an analyst or data scientist. Raise your hand. You like do this work. Okay, and you are the people who make decisions. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay, so I'm assuming that's the rest of the people. There's probably a few stragglers who just came for free lunch. Um, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Take it away, Reese. Hi. Hey. Hello there. My name is Reese Chenard. I work at ATB Financial as an, a data scientist within this little group called Enterprise Data Science. And they asked me if I wanted to do a talk about machine learning, and I was instantly really torn. Okay, am I going to talk about like how we sometimes just access it, uh, you know, quick and dirty to to get something done as part of a bigger project, or am I going to go into details and talk about some of the instances where you're in the nitty gritty and you're developing feature sets and training the models yourself? And I said, nope, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to talk about when do you build, buy, or borrow when you're trying to use machine learning as a solution to some kind of a business problem you have. 
So I'll do a couple slides on the history just to get everyone kind of acquainted. Uh, Bayes' theorem is at the heart of a lot of machine learning and it's been around for a couple hundred years. And back in the 1950s, they made the first really self-learning machine. It was something called Snark and it was basically like a little robot they built to simulate a mat, uh, a rat finding its way through a maze. So this is a picture of one of those neurons from this first self-learning computer. So really this stuff has been around for 70 years so you might be thinking like, why all the hype now? Why, why all of a sudden am I hearing so many things about machine learning and artificial intelligence? I mean, people like, you know, Alan Turing, the father of modern computing, have really had this idea in their minds for a really, really long time, but all of a sudden now it's just coming to life. And really the answer is at this point in time, we have more data, more computing power, and really more problems than we've ever had before. So we finally have kind of the, the hardware and the software that's required to solve a lot of these big problems uh, using the algorithms that have been around forever. And to just kind of give you an idea of why we're in this, this era of max hype, this is just a bar chart showing a forecast for the, the deep learning market revenue just in the United States. So we're around here 2017, 2018, and you can see it's gonna shoot up like a hockey stick both in the software, hardware, and services sectors of this market. So anytime you see a nice hockey stick shaped curve like uh, this in the future of an industry, that means that there's huge potential for anyone who's good at solving problems or handling big data sets to really uh, you know, earn a good living, but also solve lots of interesting and challenging problems. And I was doing a little bit of background research. Okay, what is the actual size of like the machine learning industry? And there's this market research company, and they said that from 2017 till 2022, they're estimating that this machine learning market will grow worldwide from about 1.4 billion US to 8.81. So that's about 44% compound annual growth rate. That's huge. That's a ton of potential to just work on really, really cool things and, uh, you know, make something of your career if you're interested in getting into things like data science and machine learning. So that's, that's the context for kind of why we should care. But now I wanna bring it back down to the ATB level and I'm gonna go over three different use cases. So times that we've actually applied machine learning in a business context to produce an output or solve a business problem with varying degrees of uh, complexity and actual uh, manipulation of the, the underlying models. So the first scenario, buy. This is like, okay, I just want to access machine learning as some kind of a service or access an API to really do the heavy lifting. And there's tons of services available. IBM, Watson, Google has a whole suite of machine learning APIs. Amazon has their own suite of tools. You're kind of in this realm if you have a problem that's already well-tread, something that you know has kind of been solved before. It's not like cutting edge research. If you can find a machine learning solution where the cost of accessing it isn't really prohibitive. This is another good sign. You shouldn't be reinventing the wheel and, and hiring a team of data scientists. If you're on tight, tight deadlines or you just want a proof of concept, you're not doing like a fully built commercial product. You're just kind of trying to show something works. You're probably in this regime where you just want to try and, and buy or get the quickest access you can to some kind of a machine learning solution. So as a use case, I'm going to talk about uh, chatbots. So we had this business problem at ATB where a lot of our staff spend a lot of time on administrative tasks. So this is stuff like uh, go find the website and uh, you know fill out your timesheets or go find another website and fill out when you're going to do your vacations. Find that one link that was emailed to you that you accidentally deleted and you know go and fill out some form. You end up spending a lot of your time doing these uh, administrative tasks and if you're a fairly technical person this can become a bit of a burden. You don't get to do as much of the high value work that you want to. So someone on my team in enterprise data science, he's sitting in the front row here, Tyler, he said, Reese, Google just came out with this really sweet uh, Hangouts chat API and we, they already have a natural language API. Let's see if we can build a chat bot. And we were working on a uh, collaboration with the U of A where we were researching event driven architecture. So I was like, yeah, why not? Like, see if you can uh, build a chat bot. So under the hood, we're accessing Google natural language API, which is essentially free in the, in the amount of API calls we're making. 
we're not paying anything. It costs a couple dollars a month to host this whole project in Google Cloud Platform. And it's using this pre-trained neural net that's kind of uh, analyzing the text and trying to figure out what the person who's typing to the chatbot is actually trying to ask. So in under two weeks, we were able to create, Tyler was able to create a chatbot that actually interpreted human text, went and did a SQL query, and then spit some kind of a, a usable answer or something of use back to the user. So this is kind of what it looks like. I load up my little chat window and I fire up my bot, Alpha 6. So if you grew up watching the Power Rangers, uh, like, like a kid in the 90s, you might remember Alpha 5 was like the goofy little helper bot. He was always like, Zarda and the Power Rangers are in trouble, blah, blah, blah. So we decided to name our first little chatbot after Alpha 5 and we named him Alpha 6. And I really hope no one sues us uh, for copyright, but it's just, Alpha 6 is kind of the, the name behind this first chatbot. So you load up your chat window and you ask it a question. I might ask it something like, what's the weather like? Then we call the Google natural language process API. It has some neural net running in the backward background. It says, this is what I think Reese is getting at. It extracts what's called an entity. It's like a, a noun of great importance. And then it says, okay, of all of the things that Reese was talking about in this message, what do I think he's trying to get at? And then we custom built a little memory bank for this robot in the back end. So our program goes, grabs that, and then it says, okay, I think Reese is looking for the Edmonton weather. It spits the response back to me. So very, very quickly for this first scenario, we didn't, we didn't care. We had access to one of the world's best NLP uh, platforms. We weren't gonna go and reinvent the wheel, especially not for a proof of concept. So we were able to really, really quickly just use machine learning as a service and deploy a tool and get something out of it that really helps solve a business problem. And as part of that project, uh, the manager said, you have to build a how-to guide because you can't just do this for fun. You have to build a how-to guide, give it to the rest of the organization. And within the last two months since handing out this chatbot guide, we've had about 10 other chatbots be created because everyone was like, wow, I want to be able to do that. The HR people are like, we have questions all the time. We get hundreds of emails a day that are just really, really simple. We can just have a chatbot answer those questions. We have IT chatbots frequently ask questions. Someone made a little chatbot where you ask it, where's, where's a good place to eat around ATB Place downtown? And the chatbot goes and does a little query and says, these are the restaurants nearby here that are ATB businesses. There's developer hotkey bots, uh, Git bots that tracks merge requests. Like very quickly, we've been able to scale this one idea all throughout the organization to provide value across the board and just doing a ballpark return on investment, it's like a factor of 10 to 50 for dollars you put into the bot versus what you get out of it in cost savings for time. So the minute someone uses a bot for the first time every month, it's already paid for itself. It's essentially a no brainer. So that's the first situation, that's just buy. The second scenario is what I'm calling borrow. This is when you're leveraging open source machine learning packages and kind of uh, putting them in your data analysis stack so you're in this realm, if you know your problem has some kind of an existing open source solution, the cost of APIs might be too high for this one. So you can't just kind of buy it off the shelf. And usually you want some kind of customized ability of the package, but it also should just kind of work out of the box. And quite often you're, you're doing a proof of concept, but you usually have more time or flexibility in this situation. So for our use case for borrow, uh, I'm gonna talk about optical character recognition. This is a really fancy way of saying, we have a business group and they get a whole bunch of financial summaries every uh, month. And it looks like this, it's always really structured text. And they wanna be able to pull that information out because right now we have a, a bunch of humans doing this and those humans are better at managing relationships. They shouldn't be doing uh, manual tasks like this if they don't have to. So we actually use this open source package called Tesseract that, uh, Google has kind of been developing since 2006. It was originally started by HP. Um, and so really under the hood, it's got, well, in the legacy version, an adaptive classifier, or in the newer version that we're using, an LSTM network, which is a type of uh, recurrent neural net. So really it's like really complicated machine learning under the hood, but really you load up the package and you're past the main hurdle, which is going from a financial statement like this to a bunch of 
uh, data on all of the characters, where they exist on the page you're looking at, what is the confidence you have associated with that. So we can see it pulls something like Paul's Plumbing, and then it just gives you a giant data set nested with all of the information about where the characters exist, what words exist on the page. And then you sit down and start doing the, the dirty work, the, the data science part, which is uh, mapping from kind of this messy input data to a nice structured output data. So in under a week, uh, again, Tyler was like the, the lead on this project. We were able to go from a scan of someone's financial document to a reconstructed financial table in a Google Sheet or something like this. So if you work in an organization that still has people manually pulling data, you should really start to think about the situation when you can just borrow and really implement machine learning really, really rapidly to start deriving value. So for this particular use case, they're talking about just this was a really quick and dirty, uh, like on a subset of the overall uh, business, well, I, I wanna say business space. They were taking a test case and they said, even if we just automate this little sample of, of uh, text documents that we're processing, the savings will be millions per year. And the goal really is to not reinvent the wheel. We have this Tesseract package, it's far superior to anything we could ever make uh, because it was developed by you know, HP and Google. So just take it, use it, and get something out of it. And you know it's got machine learning inside. So I'm running low on time, but I am gonna try and still do this justice. This is my favorite, favorite scenario as a, as a physicist in the wild. This is build. This is when you kind of need to do a full analysis and really get into the weeds. Usually this means your problem requires a tailor-made solution. There's no package that does exactly what you want. The APIs don't exist. You might need to do a lot of feature creation and really do a lot of heavy tuning of your models. And also if, if you think that the machine learning is gonna give you some insights about your data, then this is usually a good road to go down. So I did this project uh, a couple months ago and I was trying to detect a type of behavior. And I'm not allowed to say what the type of behavior is, because if I tell you what the type of behavior is, the people will go and change their behavior and they'll have to redo my machine learning model and I don't wanna do that. <laughs> so we're detecting risky behavior. That's just what I'm gonna say. And I had to sit down with the business owners and say, okay, when you guys see this risky behavior, what does it look like in the data? And you go through the raw data with them and they say, this is a dead giveaway. That's another dead giveaway. This kind of looks weird. Uh, it shouldn't look like this in the data. And then I went away and I spent a couple months just pulling out as many features as I could. A feature is just a characteristic that you see in the data set. It could be the sum of the number of times someone did something or how long it took someone to do something. But you pull this feature set out that kind of characterizes the behavior. And then you start testing a whole bunch of machine learning algorithms. And today we have like any machine learning algorithm you could want at your disposal. So really you just hit up SK Learn and you start testing. So these are all of the machine learning classifiers I tested to see which one was gonna give me the best performance. We did a naive Bayes, uh, we did a support vector machine, a logistic regression, a random forest, and something really sweet called a relevance vector machine, which is similar but not the same to a support vector machine. And because it's so new and kind of esoteric, Tyler actually had to take like an, an Octave package and convert it to work in Python, which was kind of a pain, but we were able to take it and learn it. And on one single training versus test data set, we got accuracies uh, anywhere from 88% to 94% on that first sample. So that really tells me machine learning is a, is a good solution here. We can actually tease out the behavior we're interested in in the form of a signal and discern it really, really well from the background, the, the normal behavior we don't care about. And at the end of the day, the winner ended up being a random forest, which is too bad because I was hoping like something like the RVM was gonna work or something a little bit more esoteric that requires more tuning. The random forest is just like this beautiful thing that you dump a bunch of garbage into and it just pulls out all of these answers and you're kind of like, oh yeah, it's, it's a, little bit, a little bit of a bread and butter type thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, we were able to take this, do a bootstrap to make sure we understood the confidence kind of in this algorithm over time. So you, you split up the test and the training data set a whole bunch of times, 200 times, and you look at the distribution of accuracies of how well this model does. And then you sit down with the business owner and you ask them, how many false positives are you okay with? Really, what is your limit? And then you tune it according to that. You don't just care about accuracy, you care about how often you're gonna misclassify uh, an event you're interested in as something you're not interested in. And so you can actually work 
with the business owner without them understanding any machine learning to build a tool that really helps them solve their business problem. So, you know, this is the outcome. Uh, it's saving hundreds of thousands per year. It's really reducing our risk and exposure. Uh, they got a lot of analysis out of, oh, what features actually correlate with the behavior we're trying to detect? This actually tells the business something useful. Uh, but I mean, it did take many months of development and testing. And now there is this next step of actually working it into the business process. So I'm a minute over, I'm just gonna quickly summarize. This is like the summary slide for build versus borrow versus buy. I've just shown the cost structure here for the three situations. And this is just a really general rule of thumb. If you can stomach uh, external costs, you've got a lot of money, but maybe not a lot of people, usually it's easier to try and buy. I mean, give or take, depending on the situation. Borrow is kind of the middle ground. You do have to do a lot of development and tweaking those packages. So there's a balance between external costs, money you're spending and internal effort in the term in terms of people hours. And then the build situation is like, you're usually spending the, less, the least amount of money on external products, but you are spending the most amount of money internally on people hours. So this is just loosely a rule of thumb for, for which scenario you might be in and what the outputs might look like. And with that, I'm at 17 minutes. I went two minutes over. So thanks for listening. Do you want to do questions now for a couple minutes, Dan? Okay, thanks, guys. Anyone? Go ahead, Sergey. So I know, I know in banking in particular, there's a common issue of uh, digital models of bias. And bias could be relational or gender bias or educational bias. So what's your stand on that? So how do you, what's your position on that? My position on bias is trying to detect it whenever possible and work it into the model. So if you know that it's kind of skewed one way or the other, you can actually pick the type of machine learning classifier you're going to use that uh, maximizes your reduction in that bias. You can also play a little bit with, if you think your model is biased towards a certain situation, you can pick the model and then you can tune your parameters to reduce the negative impact to the business of what you think your bias is. And so really there's, there's, never, one, one, uh, there's never a one size fits all solution. But the best thing you can do is sit down with the people who made your data set and say, okay, how is this collected? How often is it collected? Do you trust it? Would you bet money that this data is correct in showing the underlying thing or not? And sometimes it's really clean and you can go off on your way. Other times you might have to say, no, I'm assuming a huge variance associated with this. They, they really don't trust the accumulation mechanism. And yeah, there's never a one size fits all. Every situation ends up being unique, but the only way to get at it is like ask someone who's worked with the data a long time or who's really close to where it gets collected and say, how does this get collected? Well, you know, it's essentially teasing out what's called your systematic uncertainties versus your statistical. How much is just random fluctuation? If you had a perfect measuring device what kind of a, a distribution would you get? And if you didn't have a, if you had something that was always the exact same value and you had an imperfect measuring device, what would the width of your distribution be because of that? And it's really hard to tease those two things apart, but it's absolutely critical for building a machine learning solution that has a good representation of reality. Did that answer your question? Sorry, go ahead. Same subject, so I'm curious about whether you guys ever had the opportunity to use a second independent data set from the same um, feature set, but a separate collection mechanism. Yeah, quite often uh, we can get a very similar data set that's like describing a similar type of behavior or, you know, it should be more or less telling you the same thing. And the best thing you can do is kind of like a, a blind study where you say, I'm going to just develop everything on this data set, and then I'm gonna go and apply it to this one where it should kind of give me the same answer and kind of hold out and then say, does it do a good job there? Is it accurate at predicting some behavior in a similar data set? And if not, what is the difference between the two? Can we explain the variance? Have you been able to quantify the, the algorithmic bias in any situation you know? Because that's a real challenge for lots of One perspective on your own. I don't know if you can quantify it exactly. Usually what I do, eh, like when I'm training the classifiers, for example, I didn't expect the naive Bayes to work because I said I have features that I know are linearly dependent. So this one should not do that well. And I kind of use that as a bench line 
when I was benchmarking some of the other ones relative to it. So you can't always quantify it exactly without knowing exactly what your measuring device is and what its statistical uncertainties are. And you kind of just have to trust that if it does a good job of reproducing uh, you know, your picture of reality, that you, you have hope that there's not too much bias in it and it's at least better than nos nothing or better than a human trying to use their intuition. So I'm at 21 minutes. We have time for more questions. Okay, anyone else? Uh, sorry, Natasha, go ahead. Um, for the buy option, yeah. I've had problems in the past where the company you're relying on changes what they provide. So like, do you guys have any sort of evidence to deal with that? Yeah, so this is a very good point. When you go and buy something, the worst case, worst case scenario is you buy something and then the person says, we're no longer supporting this or we're no longer providing this. The thing we usually do is rely on a big company like uh, Google or Amazon, someone where you're paying a little bit more than the cheapest option, but you're buying security with that. We also do uh, something called a business continuity plan or like a disaster recovery type plan where they say, if this model was like completely deleted all of the source code somehow, would we be able to quickly reproduce this? Or if someone got rid of that API we were calling, would we quickly be able to find something else? And usually you, you use that to calculate the inherent risk of going with this product. But quite often it's like, if Google for some reason stopped doing this, we would just tie into the Amazon API or we would use some other software provider and we might end up incurring a bigger cost or whatever. But at the end of the day, you wanna think, has more than one person solved this? Because if you're calling an API that's very proprietary, there's greater risk associated with that but that shouldn't really stop you from forging ahead and solving the business problem. You just have to be cognizant of it uh, so you don't get kind of caught in a bad spot. So thank you very much, guys. So uh, Shazan is switching, or did I pronounce that correctly? Is it Shazan? Okay. Well, Shazan is setting up. Uh, there is a job opportunity, but raise your hand if you are an employer and you're looking to hire data scientist or analyst type people right now. Right now you have a job posting out. The only hand up is mine. So Dark Horse is hiring. We are hiring and it's posted on our website. We're looking for someone with one to five years experience doing this kind of stuff can be machine learning, can be statistical, can be operations research. Uh, we want you to be able to wrangle data right through to talk to people about what you did in English. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> he's just bugging you. All right, so. Uh, Oh, so if you go to the Lunchalytics site, this is a little secret for the Lunchalytics community. All the good jobs go there, and we, we, what's the word? We curate. We curate only the best. So you can go there, and, and uh, maybe we'll take a look at the website in the next break. But without further ado, take it over, Shazam. Um, well, uh, Riz gave a nice introduction to some of the business cases with text analytics. So I'm going to delve into like some of the technical details of that. Uh, I'm Shazam. I'm a machine learning scientist with the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. So today I'm going to like talk about like text analytics with machine learning and more specifically about how to build a predictive analytic uh, workflow to analyze text data. So first, uh, the roadmap is going to be like, I'm going to give her like a very really brief introduction to like machine learning and we'll discuss some of the tasks in text mining. Then we'll talk about like how we can think about pre-processing text to apply machine learning. And one of the another transformation step after pre-processing is going to be how to transform the pre-processed text into some form of a vector representation so the machine learning models can be applied directly. And finally, we'll talk about how we can perform predictive modeling on this transformed data. And finally, we'll put all these pieces together to create one uh, single work, uh, predictive analytic workflow. Um, so what is a learning algorithm or what is machine learning is kind of like a very high level question. I have some formal and informal definition here, which I'm not going to talk about. But in my mind, in layman's term, what I think about is, I mean, traditionally, computer algorithms are basically like uh, explicitly programmed or given instruction to perform some task. Whereas in machine learning, computer algorithms are kind of learning, uh, are taught to learn from data and adapt to data to perform some task. 
of course with more data over time it can adapt and it can perform the same task better whereas in some programmed explicitly programmed algorithm or a computer software are going to be like very rigid on that context so these are the kind of a uh, main difference between uh, traditional programming versus uh, machine learning based program so and there are two uh, major flavors uh, when it comes to machine learning one is supervised learning and other one is unsupervised learning supervised learning uh, you can think in very simple terms about learning from data where we have labels or like where we know what the outcome is going to be for instance let's uh, think about couple of images right so let's say we want to build a, uh, some form of uh, algorithm we are given an image to identify whether it's a cat image or something else so if you have a set of bunch of images say uh, labeled for instance like this is a cat image and this is a dog image or this is not a cat things like that we can use that kind of set of images as training data and feed it into a supervised learning algorithm called classification algorithms and train that algorithm to uh, give us uh, some model called classification model so once we have this model we can easily get a new uh, data instance where we don't know the outcome of and use this model to predict what the outcome is going to be so this is simply kind of a gist of what supervised learning is in contrast unsupervised learning work with data where we don't know the outcome of or like the desired output is going to be latent in some uh, sense so for instance like uh, let's take a, an, again another image uh, example we have like uh, let's say that bunch of images where we don't know what i mean which image is which so we feed that into some unsupervised learning algorithm such as clustering and the idea is this algorithm would automatically figure out similar uh, automatically cluster similar images together without knowing which image is which right so here you can see the bananas banana images have been clustered together strawberry images has been clustered together so things like that so this is one form of task on the unsupervised learning there are like a lot of other tasks same as in the supervised learning case as well so that's the main two distinction point and there is another area called reinforcement learning which is not relevant to the today's topic mainly but so these are the two main stuffs and now let's with this in mind we'll take a look at like what kind of text mining applications exist in the current context so one um, preliminary one is text classification and regression you might have, you might have, you might be familiar familiar with like a lot of uh, applications under this task right sentiment analysis where like we are trying to like figure out whether the particular amazon review is a positive review or a negative review and to analyze twitter data to like identify happy tweets sad tweets sad tweets this kind of stuff whereas in like spam filtering which is a very old applications of text mining like figure out given a text whether it's a spam or not right so this all all of these kind of applications falls under text classification and regression task set and on the other one is like the name identity recognition we are like given a text extract relevant information out of that text for instance like uh, people's names or like locations you know like some quantity things like that ratios and all this kind of relevant information you can be pulled out of the text so that's another type of task exists in the current literature and people uh, to perform these kind of tasks people mainly use like sequence classification models such as conditional random fields recurrent neural that sort of stuff so this is a popular area of work as well and uh, reese was talking about uh, conversational ai chatbots and as well so question answering is another very popular area in recent year and they have been like gaining a lot of traction over the past two years actually so you will see application of question answering in visual qna chatbots and conversational ai very uh, frequently and the techniques used to address these kind of problems mainly is in recurrent neural network domain which gives like very high performance at the moment and summarization and machine translation again are uh, another two important text applications so these are like some of the applications existing in text mining domain with this understanding we'll take a look at like how we can build a predictive analytic workflow to address some of these problems not like all of them but like at least some of these problems so you have an idea and graph how to process text and finally arrive at a particular solution right um the first uh, task when it comes to like uh, using text for machine learning is how do we access data mostly text data is considered as very unstructured and comes in various flavors right so what does unstructured means basically text data is like free format data so you don't get like nice columns or it doesn't look like a nice excel sheet right it's very free format and it comes in various forms for instance it, you can get uh, text data from like scanned images or like it can be coming from html files json objects things like that right so how do we process that so and it can be very much noisy so if you consider like a uh, scanned image like this so it's like very old image and if you do a ocr or something like that on top of this most of the characters might not be able to identify there can be like a lot of noisy uh, text and all this kind of stuff so how do you deal with that 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 sort of problem we have to think about 
and it's very problem specific as well. So to tackle this kind of situation, there are like a couple of uh, different pre-processing techniques exist in the literature. So like I try to categorize some of these techniques, but uh, to be honest, it depends on the problem actually. So based on the problem and the based on the based on your data set, these can be like more or less different. And so like you will be using like either some of the techniques, but might not be all. For instance, like to load raw data um, from uh, scanned images, we can think about using OCR, like Tesseract kind of libraries and stuff. To read HTML JSON object, we have parsers from Python or like other libraries. So that sort of things we can use. After loading the data into some form of a programmatical structure, then we can start thinking about how to get rid of noises. So maybe like in HTML files, getting rid of headers, footers, that sort of stuff. And it's going to be like very specific to the text data you have, right? So that's one thing. And after doing these noise removal and all these sort of stuff, we do something called tokenization or segmentation. So tokenization is basically about given a um, text chunk, you will start uh, segmenting that based on the spaces, right? So you will get individual uh, words separated. So you will have a, a text chunk will be like transformed into a, a array of uh, words, basically. So once we have this array of words, we can apply some text, uh, set of techniques called normalization, where it try to like standardize the this array of uh, words across the database into the same level. So for instance, like case transformation. So like different uh, text data might have like different, different cases, right? So you want to normalize that kind of stuff. So case transformation. So lemmatization and stemming deal with like uh, making the word into some uh, very uh, standard form. For instance, like, for instance, let's take running, right? So it can be run, running, or ran, things like that. So how would you like normalize this across like different text? So that sort of stuff we can deal with in these kind of pre-processing steps in lemmatization and stemming. And stomp for removal is like basically if you find like some words are not relevant to your task, you can get rid of those words. So you those kind of pre-processing can be done at this stage at first. So once that piece is done, uh, the pre-processing part is done, now we have to think about how we can feed that into a machine learning algorithm, right? So basically, machine learning algorithms are very much uh, focused on dealing with numerical vector vectors. So it can't basically uh, take some text data directly into the machine uh, as input to that algorithm, right? So that's one of the major challenges in how do you make this transformation. So how do you transform this kind of uh, text data into a vector, numerical vector representation, one of the major challenges in the text mining literature, right? So to address this problem, people have come up with uh, something called vector space model. This is a little bit old, older model, and but it's well used. This simply like create, start creating uh, a numerical vector representation for each of the uh, text uh, data, for instance, let's say that D1, D2, D3 can be like three different data. So they, let's say document one, document two, document three. So we can create uh, this uh, vector space model, start creating uh, some numerical vector based on the um, frequency, uh, frequency of the terms exist in the database. For instance, if you look at like uh, all these three uh, data instances, we have only four words, right? Edmonton, Toronto, Sun, and Journal. So it would start creating the frequency based vector how many instances of Edmonton exist in D1, how many instances of Toronto, Sun, and Journal. So by that, we will get a one zero one zero kind of vector, sort of that. So this is based on the term frequency. Once this, uh, this is one of the preliminary form of uh, vector representation for text. Once this is there, you can start actually, uh, start uh, using some of the scores, such as IDF scores, and start weighting these terms as well. So IDF kind of scores, uh, actually like here I have, uh, I have, I have a weighted uh, representation where like, each individual term frequency has been weighted using IDF, so 0 0.584, things like that. So this basically, what IDF score does is it tries to approximate the rareness of a particular word. If a particular word is very rare in your database, it kind of has high importance, right? If a particular word is very common, it doesn't have that much significance in terms of the classification task. So you give low preference to that. So that kind of ups and downs, you can deal with this kind, this kind of representation. So these are like two different uh, representation in the, from the past. And the recent literature, word embedding has become very popular and had very good accuracy compared to this TF-IDF based streams. So I'll try to explain like what word embedding based uh, representation is about. Uh, <clears throat> this has become actually like very much popular because of the availability of large chunks of data, for instance, Google News dataset. So what people do is like what researchers have done is take this kind of like a very large corpus of data and start creating pair of target words and the context of that target word. So the context means, given a target word, what kind of words you will see uh, in that context surrounding of that word, right? So same sentence, if you have one target word, what kind of other words you will see in like some defined window of that word. So that's the basic idea. Then you will start creating that, that kind of pairs, like the target and the context, target context. 
and you will have like some artificially generated trained data from big corpuses of uh, data like Google News. Then you start training a neural network to predict, given the target word, the context. So given the target word, you start looking at predicting the context, right? So this would train, you would train a neural network like that. And then in, in the end, after training the whole neural network, so we can, uh, we can use the hidden layers of that particular target word, hidden weight metrics of that particular target words as the neural net, uh, numerical representation for that particular word. So this numerical representation kind of give the gist of how the context work for a particular word, right? So given two words, if both of them can be seen in the same context, that would have a very high similarity in the high dimensional space. So that's the kind of idea. I know this is a little bit confusing and very tricky, but don't worry about it. You just have to understand given a word, this can generate a uh, very nice uh, numerical representation. And this is highly trained because you would use a very large corpus such as Google News compared to like your local database. So that's the advantage of using this kind of a uh, embedding. Well, once we have, now we have pre-processed the data. Now we have performed uh, some numerical trans transformation to get some numerical vector representation. Now we can think about how you start applying machine learning on this data. So that leads us to the classification. You can replace this with anything such as classification, regression, or like even clustering, so unsupervised learning. So it doesn't matter. The idea here is, okay, let's assume this example. We have uh, red dots and blue dots, right? So this each dot, you can think of it as like projected, I mean, uh, individual, uh, let's take an example such as Amazon review, right? It's so like identifying negative versus positive reviews. So, so let's say um, after transforming that individual reviews into some form of vector representation, you can project it into this three-dimensional space. So let's say that blue dots represent uh, positive reviews, whereas in red dots represent negative reviews. So what classification means, like you have to identify, you have to approximate a function to figure out uh, this decision boundary, which is a hyperplane here, right? So this uh, gray color hyperplane. So once uh, we, we have like a lot of classification models such as linear models, support vector machine, random forest, and all this kind of stuff to approximate this function or the, this hyperplane. Once you have that, when you get a new uh, review, you can crunch that data and process that data, get the numerical representation, project it into the high, high dimensional space. Even if you don't know whether it's like positive or negative, you can figure out which side it's gonna fall under, right? It's gonna fall under positive or it's gonna fall under negative. So that's the basic idea of like doing the classification. So there are like a lot of tools in Python or like Java or whatever, you can use like do all these stuff. You don't need to like program anything from the scratch. You can start using libraries. So classification, you have like a psychic learn and all this stuff like you can easily use for performing these kind of tasks to optimization all these things no one no one really code these things anymore from the scratch these days so <laughs> so that's about the classification piece and now let's see how we put all if all of these things together we started with the raw data we started looking at how we can pre-process these stuffs and once the pre-processing is done we can look at how we can transform that pre-processed data into some form of a vector representation and once you have that numerical representation we can start looking into training or apply machine learning algorithm on that data. Once that piece is performed, finally we'll be coming up with something called trained machine learning model. This can be used to like do some predictions or some knowledge discovery or those kind of tasks. So I think that's about it. It was pretty fast. <laughs> if you have any questions, please ask. <laughs> where you're going to do some clustering on, um, on some text. So for example, say you have um, uh, a bunch of, of news stories about a given topic um, from multiple different newspapers. And those newspapers might be targeted at different uh, segments of the population. So well-educated, uh, high school, and so on and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so in that instance, what are some techniques that you can implement to avoid accidentally clustering on the newspaper publication as opposed to, say, the sentiment? So are you looking at like clustering a particular article yeah, so into the say, correct category or something? So like? say, um, let's make it a little more complicated. So you have a bunch of articles, mm -hmm. and you know that, um, that some of these articles are positive and negative sentiment. Or maybe there's like five sentiments. OK. Uh, and and you don't know necessarily what they are, what it determines classifications by, by clustering, um, by clustering okay. analysis on the text. So you basically so you don't have the labels and need that you can implement to avoid um, your cluster being the Edmonton Journal and the Edmonton Sun as opposed to 
this this article is positive and this article is positive. already confounded from yeah. the source. Yeah, yeah. I think what I understood from your question is like you don't have the labels, but you want to like figure out clusters from existing data. Yeah. Like based on some unsupervised models. Maybe one thing is you can start looking into something called uh, topic modeling. So topic modeling is an unsupervised approach. So you can throw a topic modeling on some set of text documents. It would start determining um, what kind of topics ex exist in a particular document, right? Yeah. So the good thing about this topic modeling is, like, say, like uh, we are defining in algorithm, okay, we need ten topics. So for each document, it would start uh, figuring out a topic distribution. So topic one is 0.5 probability, topic two is probability. Cool. So same news article can have sport in like 0.5 probability and entertainment in like 0.3 probability, things like that, right? Good thing about it is these topics are kind of interpretable. For the topic one, you will be getting a bunch of words which defines that topic. So maybe you can do apply this kind of a clustering first, then start looking or try to interpret those topics based on the words, right? That can be one approach. You seem like a productively impatient kind of a guy. I'm if, you're, uh, if you're opinionated or you have any experience with using automated uh, pipeline tools so to be able to compare and contrast different models or different type of parameter tuning on models. And the third step of your work so you've already got all the text classification set up done, and now you're trying to decide on the model in approach with auto ML or default or anything else like that. So I'm more of a, a hands-off <laughs> approach. I'm more of a from the scratch guy. So like I use most of them scikit learn. Okay. So I'd say scikit learn actually has something called pipeline yeah. like uh, develop. So you can like figure out uh, pre-processing steps and you can embed those stuff into this pipeline uh, class. And it will create some pipeline object and you can use the, those stuff on like grid search or whatever in combination with grid search CV and all these kind of stuff to like figure out the best optimal parameters and the best pre-processing techniques. Where do you do that in your process? Do you do that early on to try to narrow, narrow down the scope of what you're going to search for or, uh, or later on to try to validate the approach? We usually work, work on like Jupyter notebooks and Python and those sort of stuff. Yeah. And we do some prototyping, take a sample set of data, start doing some analysis on this, try to do some grid search on the sample data and see like which comes the best best before applying the whole thing on the large data set. Right. So you need to like narrow down some parameters before drilling into like the more gradual levels, right? So then once you pick those sorts of data, exactly how long you can distinguish them. <laughs> It always an iterative process. Yeah. If you achieve the expected accuracy you want, then like most of the time pre-processing techniques, even though I, exp I explained a lot, you might not need all of these pre-processing techniques. We just start with the raw text at first, do the tokenization, get rid of punctuations and like these kind of noisy stuff. Yeah. But sometimes stemming limitization is not required if the text is pretty good. Yeah. So very large data set, you don't really need those stemming and limitization. You would get like about 90% accuracy if the text data set is pretty huge. Yeah. Okay. But like, um, as I said, it, based, it is based on the task at hand, right? If it is a smaller task and a hard task, then you would need to like, spend a lot of time on doing optimization of parameters. Yeah. But you might not need that though. Thanks. No worries. Uh, question on the, the upfront work. I mean, ultimately you have like the learned approach and the, the unlearned approach where you can your cluster things or you already know sort of segments that you think you're looking for. Uh, it's a, is that more of a business decision in terms of you know, let's say I'm having a chatbot and I want to see if it's happy or sad, uh, very binary or maybe three pieces of the puzzle, or would it be more beneficial to say, you know, we're going to not use that, assume that we have 16 different emotions that people are talking about, and then build that. I know that's extremely complex in comparison to, you know, learning and training with very linear or very specific discrete pieces. Um, how, does, how does that decision kind of come into? Is it like a resource available? Is it sort of about a time available? What kind of determines uh, how creative you want to be with determining the, the various levels of settings that you can actually cluster and, and look for. So it's also based on the data available, right? So if you're looking at like 60 classes, then you need to have enough sufficient data for like each class as well, right? But that, that's assuming that you know what the data is there. Like you could, you could pull out, if I said, if I had an hour long interview with somebody, you know, there'd be enough words to have 50 classifications probably. But the, 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 the depth of that concept would be much lower than if I had 100 conversations of various pieces. So is, is it more is it more beneficial or is it strictly a business decision to have more classifications than less? Um, it's strictly, I mean, for me, if I understand your question correctly, yeah. for me, it's more like uh, the data you have, right? So if you have more data on like representing the classes, then probably you would go for like high number of classification, the granularity levels will be higher. 
So like for instance, like if you are going to apply like deep learning or like that sort of more learning models, it gonna, it's going to overfit a lot if you have like very less number of data per class. So like ideally, like you would start with like high level classes, say like negative, positive kind of things. Then if you have like good performance on that front, then you would like drill down to more granular levels from that point. So that's how I view it like in that aspect. Sure. Sure. Is it pretty standard to use the vector embedding outputs into a classification model? That's something I would try at first actually. Okay. Okay. That that usually gave like uh, gives a lot of good results these days. So usually you start with like um, these word vectors it's available online. So you can like use pre-trained word vectors. You can download from Google, I mean, Google, they have a website. So you can download that. So you start with that, then you start like uh, updating those trained data, those pretend vectors based on the data you have, right? So you feed your corpus into that. So it's kind of update from, it doesn't start with some random vector, it starts with the pretend vectors from Google News. So you'll update that and start with that, and that usually gives you good, good results, actually. And then when you get the, so I guess my question was, you get the output from the vector embedding, and then feed that into the classification model. Yeah, yeah. straightforward, yeah. I work with the data which is really collected with the data. So this is okay. missing spaces between the for example, missing out. So it's because reg gas will fail. So the matizer also will So how would you deal with that? I was thinking we already have that utilization part done by uh, some machine learning or something like that. to that. What if we apply some machine learning methods to the uh, I haven't dealt with the spelling issue. I mean, uh, to be honest, you, I have a colleague at the back, so probably he would have dealt with that at one point. Maybe you can talk to him after, actually. So, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so that was the specific question is how do you deal with the group? So, I mean, for most of the cases, you basically try to All right, thank you very much, Shazan. That was fantastic. <laughs> so one of the things we wanted to do this year was leave a little more time for networking. Uh, so we're, we're done the formal part of the program, but we l really enjoy, if you stick around, pick the brains of the experts here and find the wisdom in the crowd. Uh, lastly, if you were wondering about this fabled j secret job board that is only accessible to Lunchalytics insiders, right there. Click on that button. There you go. Oh, at Neurosoft. Okay, yeah, so there's a couple different postings up. And if you have a posting and you want to put it up and get access to these super high-end uh, people, uh, just there's your form. You can fill it out right there. That's how we curate it. Okay, all the best. We will see you next month. And the topic for next month is startups using machine learning or analytics or data science in a startup setting. So we're still looking for speakers, I believe. Maybe one more. One more speaker. So if you are a accomplished speaker and you have something interesting to say, come talk to Craig or Reese or Russ. All right, thanks very much. We'll see you next week, but stick around and mingle. <laughs>